Welcome to Vital Conversations. How can we afford to live here? This is made possible thanks to the generous support of session sponsor Coast Capital and the Victoria Foundation. Thank you for joining us in this conversation. This session is part of the third annual Rising Economy Conference, an immersive virtual and in-person event hosted by the South Island Prosperity Project Partnership. And this is just one of more than 20 sessions building momentum for a more resilient, innovative, sustainable, and equitable post-COVID world. And Victoria Foundation launched their Vital Signs Report on November 8th. And today's conversation is a deeper dive into some of the aspects and concerning issues going on in our community. Uh, I'm Sandra Richardson, the CEO of the Victoria Foundation. And we are very pleased to work in part with SIP this week. Uh, SIP really uh, mirrors the values of the Victoria Foundation, its value of citizen engagement, impacting our economy, and building a stronger community for all. And our moderator today is Jimmy Thompson, and he is the editor of Capital Daily, Victoria's source for an in-depth news and, and, and investigations. He has won grants and awards from the likes of National Magazine Awards, the Canadian Association of Journalists, the Pulitzer Center, uh, Center for Crisis Reporting, and the Society for Environment Journalists for his reporting on community and the environment. Jimmy has taught writing and journalism at UVic and Camosun, and is building a team of journalists at the Capitol Daily that rivals the best newsrooms in the city. Jimmy, over to you. Thank you very much, Sandra. So it's said a, a rising tide lifts all boats. That tide that's rising in Victoria, the tide of property values specifically, is more like a tsunami. Those who occupy the high ground may notice their ocean view just got a little more expansive, but for those of us in the lowlands, renters and the unhoused or the young and ambitious newcomers are drowning. Our homes are being carried away by the same prosperity that's benefiting some of the wealthiest. There may be those in this city that believe their property values insulate them from this disaster. Some reporting we've been doing at Capital Daily suggests that's not the case. I was on Salt Spring Island last summer residents there are spoiled for choice if they want a cute ceramic mug or a painting of a cedar tree but if they need their fridge repaired or a new fence they're out of luck no one can afford to live there no working people can afford to live there <clears throat> but that's also the future victoria is already starting to experience in the 2022 vital signs survey a citizen survey housing and the cost of living tied for the top spot in the most important issues topic it's also the first time ever that housing received an F grade in the vital in, in the history of the of the survey. The doctor and nursing shortages are at their core affordability crises. The fact that you can't get more than a slice of pizza at past 8 p.m. in the city that has roots in affordability too. Homelessness is more closely linked with the price of rent than any other single metric. The list goes on. Home builders can't find people to build homes because those tradespeople themselves have nowhere to live. The police have spent a quarter million dollars recruiting new staff, and they just got approved the other day to spend another quarter million. BC Ferries is considering having a liveaboard live aboard workers as it faces cancellation after cancellation due to staff shortages. These shortages, all of them, are, you guessed it, a direct result of unaffordability. The living wage, it was revealed today, has gone up 20% this year. And so that's something I know Diana can get into in more depth. She's here with some of the, uh, the other best positioned people to break down what all this means for Victoria and its residents and its economy. And I'll be honored to introduce them in just one minute. Uh, but first, just a few notes on how today's panel will run. Um, 
So about halfway through the conversation, we'll start taking uh, conversation or we'll start taking your questions for our speakers. You can submit a question at any time through the Zoom Q and A below this video. The session is being recorded, and you can submit your question anonymously if you prefer. To interact with attendees, you can use the Zoom or Whova chat. The production team will monitor the Whova chat and the Q and A for those of us uh, joining us through the app. And finally, if you're posting your takeaways to social media, please use the hashtag Rising Economy 2022. That's just at the bottom of the screen as well. So uh, let's meet our panelists. We have Kelly Greenwell, the Executive Director of Quad Village Community Center. Kelly, Executive Director for Quad Village Community Center for 11 years. During this time, he's also been a steering committee member, member of the Coalition of Neighborhood Houses Capital Region. Kelly's more than 30 years of experience in community and social services work. This includes community building, program development and management, mental health and addictions work, and child, youth, and family work. He has participated in a wide range of proactive projects and programs to improve the quality of life locally. Thanks for joining us, Kelly. Thanks, Jimmy. Diana Gibson is the Executive Director of the Community Social Planning Council. Hello, Diana. Diana is a researcher, communications expert, and activist and social entrepreneur. She has worked nationally and internationally leading research and community development initiatives aimed at changing pol the policy context and providing critical evidence on the ground to make a more just and sustainable society. She has co-founded several su successful mission-driven enterprises. She's, she is a research advisor to the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and a distinguished research fellow, fellow of the University of Alberta's Parkland Institute. Thanks for joining us, Diana. Sylvia Seacero is the executive director of the Greater Victoria Coalition to End Homelessness. Sylvia is the executive, uh, sorry, Sylvia, in addition to that title, is, is a, um, a bon business owner consulting in strategic planning, governance, and risk management for other for impact organizations in BC. She is a seasoned leader, administrator, and strategist who has spent most of her career in not for profits as a CEO or, an, or executive director of organizations with multi million dollar budgets. Sylvia is an, is an activist who is passionate about building connections, well being, and engaging with everyone to enhance our community's livability for all its residents. Thanks for joining us, Sylvia. Good morning. Good morning. And Kara Udall is the executive director for cap for capital. Sorry, the executive director of the Capital Regional Region Food Share Network. Got it. Uh, fueled by a leadership philosophy rooted in community, engaging passion, cultivating purpose, and empowerment, Kara Udall has worked in the nonprofit world for more than fifteen years. She currently serves as the executive director for the Capital Region Food Share Network. Kara believes that when a group of individuals are brought together in the community where each person has a passion-based purpose, the sky is the limit as to what can be achieved. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited to get started and we'll do that right now. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a question for the whole panel. Um, in the 2022 Vital Science Citizen Survey, housing and cost of living tied as the most important issues can you share your thoughts on these two pieces being ranked the highest? And we'll start with Kelly. Sure, well, you, you can't fool the people. I mean, I think uh, we all know this is going on. Um, you know, it's been wreaking havoc with so many lives right now in the region. Uh, we're, you know, this is uh, intensified by issues like uh, uh, rent evictions that have been taking place within the city, uh, rents out of control, uh, mortgage rate hikes, uh, radical changes to gro grocery costs and other necessities and wage adjustments are not keeping pace with the rapidness of those changes. Um, and I'm not sure we can expect that they're going to be able to uh, pivot quickly enough. Uh, lots of spinoff stress is happening and that's affecting people's mental and physical well-being. And uh, I think that's a great concern to all of us because not only are these uh, statistical facts essentially in terms of what's going on in our lives uh there's an intensification of pressure that takes place uh, related to that um i'll also uh, i'm gonna throw in a, a, a follow-up while you're while you're answering the first round uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry to throw a curveball at you 
Can you just tell us a little bit uh, as well, maybe a couple of thoughts on your org your own organization's roles uh, in, a, in addressing these things as you as you go through? Well, I think, you know, one of the things uh, we, we have a housing outreach worker um, pilot project in the second year uh, supported by the city of Victoria and Victoria Foundation. And uh, we were inspired to to lead that project based on feedback that we were getting from uh, volunteers within our organization, uh, community members that we've known in some cases for a long time, uh, you know, folks that were uh, getting notice that they could no longer uh, live in their place because uh, there was a change of plans of some some form or fashion. And uh, essentially, they were being thrown into uh, a rental marketplace with with uh, very few options for starters, but uh, really no options that they could afford. Um, and with the long-term hope of uh, being on wait lists for uh, BC housing and other options there, uh, really it was, you know, great. We could see, you know, real potential for an additional wave of homelessness, uh, including, you know, couch surfing, but, you know, living on the streets, you know, happening for people that had been in stable housing for quite a while. So um, that was before we had this inflation spike. So. Uh, we're we're now living living that in that context as well, and so just um, trying to assist a lot of people who are struggling uh, to hang on within this current system. And then with the the food distribution that we do out of the community center, it's another area where uh, we could offer a weekly food pickup at one point uh, to folks that were signed up our list on our list. And now, um, you know, while there's some small supplementals, the, the overall idea of getting a bag of groceries that's happening about every six weeks now. So, um, you know, we're really, we're really seeing a huge spike in the demand. And as the demand spikes, the system is not keeping, the support system isn't keeping up, um, to, uh, mitigate that. So somebody who got a, a bag of groceries, I would argue uh, once a week. Um, you know, them getting it once every six weeks now, their, their other grocery costs, you know, out of pocket are now, you know, just uh, spiraling out of control. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Sarah, briefly, your thoughts. Yeah, I think one of the things that we have to remember is that there are so many beautiful aspects to the city. Uh, and because it's such an incredible, rich and diverse space, it's always been a pretty a pretty attractive tourist spot. So we, we have this strong tourism economy um, and we have this, like, I think we're one of the most desirable cities in, well, in North America, but maybe in the world, I can't remember what we're rating is. And so before COVID, before this current like tsunami of wave after wave after wave of crisis, um, cost of living was already high because of, of the external variables involved in like, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's an incredible community. People want to be here. The people want to experience it. So costs were high. And so when we started experiencing like um, catastrophic level levels of unemployment, disruptions in our food supplies, rapid increases in our like inflation rates, we it so quickly came to a point where it's like this is this is not livable, this is not sustainable, and kind of like uh, Kelly said, like it's you can't fool anybody. It's, it doesn't it doesn't take a scientist to say this isn't this isn't sustainable, this isn't okay. We need to do something about it. Um, I can speak like um, our network is a prime example of the community trying to do something outside of uh, global systems. We, when we started, um, we were kind of a part of that and everybody was trying to get what they could for their own organizations to try and meet the, the needs of their own clients. Um, and then we came together and we're like, wait, there's a better way to do this. We can be at a table together. We can share resources. We can streamline processes. Um, kind of like when you have discounted um, like bulk buying, right? Costco or the, the wholesale store you get reduced rates for buying larger amounts. And that practice can be applied over a lot of different industries and a lot of different um, essentials, but we have to work together. Um, and sometimes working together isn't easy, but there's, there's great opportunity. <laughs> great, thank you. Uh, Sylvia. Um, yes, I, I actually quite, um, 
loved how you framed the conversation by talking about the those who are in the in the in the tide and those who are riding the crest and those who are drowning and um it, it sounds as you said very dramatic uh, and you did it for effect however i think it is the reality of our of our beautiful region um, where there is a huge discrepancy between the house and the have nots and um and those have nots uh, are continuing the numbers are continuing to increase and uh, many of the of the individuals that, that we support through our um, our work with our uh, community through our service providers and so on um, are the at the lowest of the of the low and they are obviously not only drowning but actually dying on the streets and um, and the all of the crises that are going on um, cannot resolve uh, obviously we have to resolve those in order to um, to help those who are experiencing homelessness in the verge of experiencing homelessness uh, couch surfing living in their vans and in their cars and uh, the community has shown that we can come together and make that happen and um, to answer your question about how our organizations do that the greater victoria coalition to end homelessness is here to not only ensure that we have that engagement with the community, engagement with our members, but also carry the voice of, uh, of the community to uh, government uh, through our advocacy efforts and, uh, and so on. Um, I think there is a result from our community and from politicians and from everyone involved to um, change what we see right now. Um, we have no choice but to actually work and um, continue to um, march uh, shoulder to shoulder to uh, to catch all of those who are um, on the fringes and those who may end up on those fringes by no um, action of their own. Thank you, Sylvia. And Diana, um, your thoughts on 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 cost of living and housing being the the tide for the two most important issues. Yeah, it definitely. I mean, our um, living wage for the region, the Community Social Planning Council calculates the living wage um, and it came out today. And definitely housing is one of the biggest drivers because it's one of the biggest portions of people's household costs. But we'll talk later about food because food was actually the area that went up the fastest and highest. Um, but on housing, um, jumping back to what Kelly said around that sort of wave idea, um, we are we run the rent bank for the region uh, and the rent bank bridges people through crisis to keep them from homeless so people who are at risk of eviction and we've been seeing that um, higher and higher household incomes are coming to us at, and the study that we did drivers of homelessness um, uh, evaluated that program and it's a program of absolute last resort so these are households that have tapped their families their friends their savings everything and then they come to the rent bank and it is absolutely the last measure for them between that and homelessness. So people don't come to come for help easily. They come for help when they're really have to have no alternative. So this is a measure. And what we're seeing is that higher and higher household incomes are coming in. So households at higher and higher income levels. So when Sylvia talked about that kind of the households that are drowning and that growing gap in terms of inequality, we're seeing that, that the, the folks that are sort of underwater are actually a higher and higher number and at higher and higher income levels. And these are households coming test with no alternative at risk of eviction. Um, so that so it doesn't surprise us to see housing be a priority in the in the vital signs or get an F grade. Um, and certainly at the rent bank, um, the households we do work with are, are spending 77.5% are spending more than 50% of their income on housing. But even all the way across the region, we, we recently we did the filling the gap report, which looked at um, housing need by income level across the region. And in that report, we found that one in five households in Victoria are actually paying more than 30% of their income on housing already. And as soon as a household is paying more than 30% of their income on housing, they become a household at risk. And we see that in accessing programs and homelessness, that it's households with more than 30% of their income going to housing, and particularly those paying more than 50% that become households at risk of eviction and into homelessness. So we see that fragility growing in the region right now. Um, and our, our filling the gap report identified that we're short over 7,000 units right now in the lower income level. So we can talk about, I think later about policy measures, but there are some, there is some low hanging fruit regionally for municipal and provincial governments to start filling that gap quickly. Thank you very much. 
Um, I, I, I appreciate the tempo, Diana. Um, that, that is, you, you sound like a, like a high school debate club member trying to get all your points across, but I, uh, you, you did it very, very elegantly and well. So I appreciate that very much. Um, <laughs> there, there is action being taken by the province of BC with rates going down in December for the cost of monthly childcare. In the Vital Signs report, it shows that spaces funded by the Ministry of Child Care and Fi Children and Family Development were up 3% last year to 30, 13,845. And we know anyone who has kids themselves or friends with kids knows that this is an issue that impacts the economy. Without child quality child care, people have to take a step back from their careers or shift in order to support their family. So let's start with Kelly, what's driving the increase in childcare costs and how are parents supposed to cope with this? Yeah, well, I think uh, there's there's been a lot of pressure within the childcare system, even, even while money is being brought into the system and investments are being made uh, around, around wages. And there's been some uh, investment that we need to acknowledge for that that's been happening uh, provincially for early childhood educators. Um, even with that, it, it's not enough. Um, the uh, after school care, uh, summer camp, um, you know, winter break camp, uh, pro D day care, all, all, all that sector of staff, those increases haven't followed along uh, the path that's, that's being uh, utilized with early childhood educators. And uh, well, you know, I agree, and and some of the prior, with some of the prioritization, the the reality is that's creating a real labor crunch. Um, child care providers across, I'm most familiar with the ones in the city of Victoria, but they're having a hard time uh, attracting uh, enough ECEs to run programs. Um, and then when the ECE credential isn't required, similar uh, challenges in uh, providing staffing are are being created there. So. Uh, of course, everybody has to start, um, if, they, if they can sustain the program with this, they, they have to uh, utilize wage increases and other incentives as the way to do that. So that in turn um, uh, fall, spills over to the parents uh, who are trying to provide you know, access care for their kids. Um, their, the pace of investment um, and builds has not kept up with the demand for space. I think the figure is something like a 3% increase in spaces uh, that's uh, being accomplished so far. Um, and this is over a period of several years now. So um, it really just illustrates how, you know, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to what's uh, required. Um, and the providers themselves, much of the compensation has gone towards uh, you know, compensating providers for inc increased wages. Again, not at a adequate pace to really keep up with the uh, wage demand. And, but the other costs that are going up for childcare providers are not really being acknowledged in the formula um, beyond the build of the initial physical space, uh, which again, even with those, some of those grants, uh, they're not substantial enough even to necessarily factor in things like the playground or the storage that's needed for the childcare facility. So again, uh, we're making more efforts than probably ever before, if you look at the provincial level to address these things, and yet we're nowhere close to being able to resolve this crisis. And of course that has ripple effects for the, for the, for the workforce. So um, the, the wage situation, the operating, operating cost situation, and the, uh, you know, at the educational level, the programming spaces to uh, that become a more and more attractive, hopefully as wages go up, um, there needs to be more spaces uh, provided so that people can get the training in that. And hopefully we can make childcare as attractive a um, profession as possible with putting, without putting all the burdens on the parents. But uh, we still got a lot of uh, broken pieces to fix. Sylvia, I want to turn that question to you as well. Um, what, uh, how, how is childcare um, specifically affecting people who are at risk of or experiencing homelessness? Uh, well, I think as uh, as Kelly just uh, suggested that when spaces are hard to come by and um, you are dependent on having your children 
in childcare in order to be able to uh, access a job and uh, keep that job and keep showing up so that you can improve your situation. When those spaces are not available, many at times individuals will then have no choice but to stay with their children in order to ensure that their children are safe and taken care of and so on, which prevents them from being uh, in available to the labor market, which further compounds their uh, the the poverty and the abject uh, desolation that they that they feel many a time. Um, certainly, you know, the government has been talking about, um, like uh, the government Quebec did, the $10 a day daycare. We have not seen the uh, that happening or panning out. And as Kelly also said, the rising costs of uh, wages, operations, and the ability to attract and retain people is so daunting right now that, um, that um, I, I am a hopeful person, but I think uh, we need to do more because uh, it may get worse before it gets better. Thank you very much. Um, Kara and Diana, if you're, if you're, uh, have things you'd like to add to that. And Diana, if you're, if you're ever going to talk to me again after I called you a, a high school debater, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, feel free to jump um, in. I can me. speak to it quickly. Um, I'll try not to put as many points in. Um, I'm very <laughs> passionate about these things and I, I want to, um, yeah, engage. I do talk very quickly. That isn't me debating. That's just how I talk. Um, <laughs> on childcare, um, we did see the province did put out a $10 a day childcare program that has made a difference because since 2019, the living wage has, the living wage went down in 2019 because of the childcare investment. And this year, the only area where costs didn't go up was childcare. So it is making a difference. Um, and I think we should really give kudos where they're due there, but it's still the third biggest area of household expenses. So it's, although it's making a difference as Kelly and, and Sylvia mentioned, it, you know, that's not enough. So we do need more spaces. We do need more action around staff costs and um, retention and attracting staff. Um, and at the rent bank, we're seeing one in, um, in, in three households are coming in with children in them. So this is households at risk of eviction. Um, so we are seeing that uh, despite that initiative the government's made, it's not enough. For sure. Thank you. Kara. Um, well, I think everyone else has covered some really beautiful points. This is not my area of expertise. However, what I can say is that for those providing the care, there's a ridiculous level of increase in the need for food for the children that they're providing the care for because of the impacts of the families who are struggling to, to meet that needs within the home. Um, and that, like, I think it was Kelly that mentioned that there's a lot of things that are not accounted for when evaluating the cost of, of childcare. And that's one of the areas that's there for sure. This is this, this overwhelming pressure on providers to feed children right down to, we see it in our schools, right? Youth and family counselors are overwhelmed by, by the need in their classrooms. I've had a call just a few weeks ago with a youth and family counselor who's feeding 35 kids breakfast, lunch, and snacks every single day of the week with almost no support. And those are things that we, I feel like as we're looking at this incredible need, um, need to be aware of uh, as we look at it as a community at what we can do to impact some real positive change and fast. Thank you. Thank you for that segue actually to the next question that I'd like to direct towards you. Um, uh, but before I do, I just want to encourage people who are watching, uh, if you do have questions, again, you can put them in the Q&A below and, and we'll get to them in about uh, nine minutes. So maybe one or, one or two questions left here. Um, so uh, Kara, the in the Community in Focus section of the 2022 Vital Signs Report, it showed that food bank visits in BC were up by 5% in 2021 compared to 2019. That was a total of 131,000 visits and 40,700 40, of those were children. So what are, what are we seeing in our region? What are you seeing in our region? And what impact is access to food having on individuals and families in making this community affordable to live? Mm -hmm. um, uh, like Diana had referenced, we're actually, the trend that we're seeing is an increase of need in the, like the dual income households, the households that, um, might not have historically been in a position to calculate whether or not um, they were able to access their, their next round of groceries or what they were gonna do for their meals um, based on the implied stability of, of two incomes. 
Um, so we're seeing, I think it's something like 14% um, of the people accessing food banks in, in the last year have been from dual income households. And whereas the trend that we're seeing within our network, and for those who aren't aware, the Food Share Network is a, is a network of over 70 nonprofit organizations in the Capital Regional District. Um, together, uh, our food programs feed over 10% of the CRD's population every month. Um, so what we're seeing is while there is uh, a slight increase to the need of existing and longstanding uh, community members, um, the, the real wave is coming from people who, who might not historically have had um, those struggles. And I think this is a part here where, I, where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach the whole community movement piece because there is an incredibly rich community network, right? The, the everybody that's here on this panel um, are like champions of, of great collaborative and community action. When we work together, when we approach large systemic issues like food in a, in, in a community mindset and we choose to act together, we can see substantial shifts. An example of that is, is our food rescue program where over 2 million pounds of food a year is being rescued and redirected through the community and that helps offset operational costs like for programs like Victoria or Quadra Village Community Center where um, the amount of things that you guys do is incredible. <laughs> the amount of, of ways and opportunities to feed the community is beautiful and that comes at a substantial cost and that's something to be calculated in the increased cost of food in our region as well because the community food providers or the community like meals or, or food markets, things like that, um, the expense is going up as well, but it's offset in areas where we're working together, where we're using that bulk buying power when we're choosing to share resources. And so while there's not much control that we have on the global market, which is terrifying right now, I, I, I do really want to speak up and advocate for what we can do here. And as far as the trends we know, supply and demand drives most rates and costs. Mm -hmm. So in, I encourage people to throw your support behind local producers, behind local businesses, behind people and, um, and, sell, and food sellers who are, have a history of ethical and integral practices where they're going to charge, like they're absolutely gonna make a profit, um, but it's still accessible. Throw your support there. And if we do that as a community, maybe the costs of some who might be profiting off of these, this pattern of crisis, maybe the rates will come down. If they don't, that's okay. We're connected with Jim over here who has this incredible <laughs> grocer or Bob over there who has you know, a rich community farm and he wants that healthy food to get to the community. Um, but I think this, what we're seeing with this increase in the, the dual income households is an opportunity for them to get to know the rich community networks that exist and for us to, to have bigger, greater conversations and to shift things so that everybody can experience equitable access to healthful food, despite what's happening in the rest of the globe. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. So we have uh, just a few minutes left, a couple minutes before we want to take some questions from, from the audience. So uh, I'm going to put this to anyone who would like to, to jump in and answer it. Um, gender and racial differences showed up pretty significantly in the Vital Signs Report. Men were more likely to report that they're well paid, that they're, that they're doing great. Uh, BIPOC people were more likely to report cost of living as an important issue facing them. Um, what is driving that gap? And, and how do we close it? I'll leave that to anyone to, to jump in and answer. Okay. I can start with that. Um, the, um, the housing needs report and the driver's homeless reports, we did looking at um, households at risk of eviction and using the rent bank. We really found that discrimination was a factor. So when you look at all other factors being equal, it was clear that discrimination was challenging individuals in access to housing. So we can connect those things in the vital signs report around um, gender and BIPOC and Indigenous and people with disabilities and housing. Thank you. Kelly? Um, yeah, I think I think we need to have a pretty significant culture shift. I think, uh, you know, in terms of 
on our mentalities as, as employers, um, you know, our, our mentalities around, um, you know, our, our workplace is not being filled with, with people who, who have identical needs, um, who have identical wishes in terms of what they, they would like to see in their workplace. And I think, um, so this is an area where, where um, you know, organizations need to really invest in the idea of how can we connect well uh, with folks, um, particularly uh, BIPOC folks uh, in the community and looking at kind of what their different needs might be, uh, their different philosophies around family and extended family, um, their different needs around um, cultural celebrations and faith beliefs. Um, and we really need to transform our workplaces to be a lot more flexible. That's one part of it. I mean, there's a wage part in this as well. And I think that's where the bias really shows, shows up. I mean, it's, it's really you know, shocking and unacceptable uh, to see that contrast still uh, with women in the workplace. And, uh, you know, see, you know, like in this panel, we so, see so many uh, women leading in organizations. Uh, but that wage gap continues to, to drag along with us. And, uh, you know, so it's just shocking in 2022 that that's the case. Um, but, you know, those stats just keep coming out every year, right? Um, so, you know, that's another one where organizations really need to, to have a gut check around, um, you know, what, what wage compensation is provided. And I think, you know, it's still that tendency uh, for, for women and uh, um, racialized folks, uh, folks who, you know, might not, not have, uh, dom say, dominant identities, uh, you know, the tendency to be limited to the lower paying jobs within the workforce. And so, again, that's, that's another place where we have to address wage equity and make some transformations, but it, it takes, a, it takes a, a lot of commitment to make that happen and uh, not just uh, being satisfied with the status quo. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia and Kara, who would like the last word on this one? Oh, sorry, yeah. Sylvia, you are you are muted. I'm sorry, that's because I was coughing earlier. I, I apologize. <laughs> um, I was saying that if I can contribute perhaps uh, a little bit to this conversation, <laughs> uh, as an immigrant woman myself, and I am uh, a white woman of privilege, obviously, um, it is it is a marked difference um, in this in this country and uh, working uh, on both sides of the table with settlement agencies in the lower mainland and um, Ottawa and Montreal and so on. Um, I see that there is a need for a continued push for women like myself who have uh, slowly but surely made it to uh, the positions we're in to uh, bring along those other women of uh, um, in the BIPOC community and, um, you know, gender, queer, LGBTQ, uh, and so on, uh, forth, but to do it in a way that is um, in a philosophy of decolonizing practices and ensuring that, you know, those practices um, reflect the reality of the world as we want to see it. I think we have a major part to play in that happening, and we need our uh, male allies to work with us to make that happen as well. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from our from, from a viewer here. Um, it's a kind of a spicy one, so I look forward to seeing what what you do with it. Um, how do we balance housing as an instrument for financial return on investment and housing for residential habitation? Are there lessons to be learned from other jurisdictions like Finland or Singapore? Um, I would add maybe Munich to that. But uh, yeah, go. Who would like to take that one? Yes, Diana. And that's a great question. And I think it comes to the crux of the issue around that deficit that I identified that over $7,000 uh, or over 7,000 units at the lower income levels is, <clears throat> and um, that really we need public, direct public investment and nonprofit housing. The market won't deliver low income and affordable housing, particularly in the current markets. And <clears throat> the market, will deliver housing and needs to, and we need to get zoning in place that allows the market to build housing for, for medium and higher income. And then to address affordability on this crisis and particularly discrimination. I mean, that 
one of the ways to address discrimination in our housing access is for the government to build that housing and make sure that it's available to folks regardless of background, income source, um, and identity. Uh, and particularly that's challenging for single parents, for, you know, in, in a tight housing market, we've seen discrimination goes way up. Um, so across all types of discrimination. So <clears throat> I think that that really is the crux of the conversation is that question of balancing a balanced market and balanced supply. There's a role for private investment in our market, but not for speculation in a market where people are going homeless and at risk of eviction. And that's a, a role for public investment in nonprofit housing. And we can do, we had a forum just yesterday with nonprofit housing providers across the region. The recording's available talking about how can municipalities better facilitate and support nonprofit housing. So there's lots of low hanging fruit there. Thank you. Would anyone else like to take this one on? Okay. So someone was asking uh, about, the, the, about inflation, um, and they brought up some of the issues that are, that are frequently cited as drivers of inflation. So COVID pandemic, cargo uh, overdoses, which I, I wouldn't necessarily link to uh, inflation, although maybe someone hasn't cited into that, uh, climate change and climate, the climate crisis, as well as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which we often hear from Christian Freeland, um, on the, the effect of those factors on inflation. Um, can, it, can anyone sort of unravel this or do other factors um, that are that are driving inflation here in I think I can speak to the the food end of things just a little bit in that um, we like culturally in North, North America we have this like, really uh, broad global, relationship when it comes to our, our trades and food purchasing. So much so that, um, don't quote me on this because my, my percentages might be off, but our island in the last decade has dropped from producing more than I think it was 70% of the food that we required to be self-sustaining to less than 5% because of our dependency on the global markets, on bringing our food in from a cheaper resource far from here introduced all of the, the recent you know, supply chain breakdowns and, and crop catastrophes around the globe. Now the demand is still ridiculously high. The suppl supply is lower than ever. The access to the supply is lower than ever. Thus inflation becoming out of this world. Um, the other side of that is, hey, let's, grow, let's, let's support local, let's grow local. We need more food grown here. Um, but that impact like that, every time we experience even, even one impact like that, it's going to ripple into every, every single field, every single area, which will lead to states like we're in now where it's like, okay, this is, this is, a, this is a ball rolling down a hill. <laughs> somebody needs to do something and the somebody is us. Thank you. Anyone else want to, want to try that one? There's, um, there's some interesting <clears throat> questions to be asked around, and I know that some, some folks are asking at the federal level <clears throat> around, for example, there was definitely an impact on supply chain from oil and gas from the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, um, which caused a global spike, but we still saw record profits made and windfall profits by some parts of that sector. And we're seeing the same in the food sector where local producers are really feeling the squeeze of supply chain issues. Um, and then on the other side, um, consumers are really feeling the squeeze, but in between there's been some places that have been making windfall profits. So I think that's something that we could look at more around some of the drivers because, you know, the living wage is being borne by individuals who are paying the cost of living at low incomes and employers, many of whom are small businesses trying to do the best thing around supporting living wage. And it's, they're already facing supply chain issues on their end. And so for those small businesses, local businesses trying to recover from the pandemic, picking up these costs and paying a living wage is challenging. So if there's ways where the government could intervene around some of those food sector or energy sector places where there is record profit being made at a time where other parts of those same sectors are really struggling, I think it might be good to look at that. Thank you. Um, I, I, I love this question and I'm going to try and sort of uh, twist it a little bit. <laughs> I apologize to the person who asked it, um, but this is this is a, a fascinating topic to me and I think that it can be a, a thrown out into a multitude of directions. So um, 
they say that an organization they were re involved in recently had daycare people being paid in the $60,000 a day or $60,000 a year range. Um, if this was not subsidized, then the parents would not be able to afford this. And so when I say that I think this can go off in a multiple, multitude of directions, I think you know what I'm talking about. This is doctors and nurses. This is teachers. This is uh, journalists. <laughs> this is everyone where if you if we have to pay people what it costs to live here, um, and Diana, maybe I know I know you can address this one very well, and I'm sure everyone else uh, has thoughts on this too. But if we if it if we pay people what it costs to live here, then the services become so expensive that no one can afford it. How how do we square that? I, it, it, this is the 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 eternal question of living in Victoria. Yeah, and this is really what we're grappling with with that massive jump in the living wage, over twenty percent increase, and three to four dollars for local businesses per hour per employee is huge, even for us as a nonprofit trying to make that jump to be able to keep our staff and two of our staff had to leave the region because and one of them it was a housing and homelessness researcher married to a teacher and they left and moved to Alberta and they said Diana I just don't see a future here for our family and it's heartbreaking so um and what we're talking about with around the living wages that there is places where the government can intervene so the the issue is um, that if we do that intervention around zoning and, and um, nonprofit housing and public purpose built housing, um, then we can start to address some of that affordability through government intervention. And so with childcare, we saw that like, with intervention on childcare, with that $10 a day childcare, although it's not enough yet, we saw the living wage go down. They can address affordability. So the province and the federal government can do more to intervene on the cost drivers so that it doesn't land on us as businesses in the local economy trying to constantly keep pace with this out of control inflation, that we can actually see them intervene and help with affordability. Um, and then we can retain our incredible quality housing researchers, teachers. Um, and then just for folks to know that 60,000 might seem high, but a household with two, the income, it's over 90,000 now that we need to be seeing a household earn with two parents with two kids in this region. So unless we get good intervention from the government on housing affordability, and food costs, that income is what's needed in order to be able to have a decent standard of living. That's not generous, that's very basic. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia, I know this is a, a major issue in the in the uh, homelessness world um, and the, the nonprofits associated with the homelessness world. So I, I'd like to hear from you on this. Yeah, um, and I, I would um, echo what Diana just said and also speak to to the fact that we are looking at government for the, to do more. You know, the government has demonstrated over and over again when there is that will to make things happen that it can. It can come together um, the same way that, you know, we as, uh, as for impact organizations or not for profits uh, collaborate with one another, another to make efficiencies and to ensure that we are being as effective with uh, the kind of funding that we get. <clears throat> we expect the same leadership from, uh, you know, the, at the federal level, at the provincial level, that uh, ministries are going to be talking to one another in order to uh, address these issues uh, hand in hand. Um, I apologize, but my phone just told me that my battery is about to die. So I hope that you're able to still hear my last words before I have to um, bow out. And I apologize for that. Um, so... Yes, I, I echo what has been said already. And I think that we are looking at government to provide the correct uh, levels of funding at all levels uh, to address these issues and across ministers and uh, across uh, all levels of government. Mm -hmm. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Um, does anyone want to weigh in on that before we go to our probably our last question, just given the, the time here? Just very briefly, I think you know one of the one of the real shames about this whole situation is the uh, you know a couple of decades of non-investment in uh, public housing that really set the stage for this. And and I think uh, there was this idea that that somehow the uh, you know, at the time that the free enterprise market economy was going to uh, create the system, uh, including addressing things like uh, housing bills and things like that, uh, so that um, you know, and that the economic prosperity would would take care of um, you know, direct ripple effects to the housing uh, units and things that we needed. 
So I, I think, you know, one, one thing is accountability and uh, it's being really articulately spoken about how, how uh, decreased housing costs, um, you know, can help decrease inflation. And um, so we, we need to keep governments accountable to continue to make these investments because there may be uh, labor shortages in construction. There may be um, a lack of access to uh, land potentially to uh, build the projects that we need to build. Um, but we need this consistent stream of building around public uh, affordable housing in order to, uh, you know, keep our people afloat, um, you know, whatever happens in terms of down, downturns in the economy. We need these baseline levels where people know uh, that they can be housed, people know that they can eat, uh, you know, people can have their basic needs taken care of. Thank you. And further to that, if I may add, I think that the report that we saw today coming out from uh, Generation Squeeze and um, Research Co. shows that the community, all communities, all Canadians are uh, to the tune of 68% are willing to have I know, uh, surtax, but certainly contribute for those who are in, at the top of the wave, contribute a little more in order to make um, affordable housing uh, possible for those who are drowning in the wave. And we saw that in this in this uh, research. And I think um, there is something that could be done there with those folks who, um, like most of us who are able to afford it, pay, pay a, a surplus, a little surtax to help out with the situation. And the fact that Canadians are behind this, I think needs to be capitalized by um, federal and provincial governments. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually um, I haven't seen the new uh, report from Gen Squeeze yet, but I, I have heard been hearing about it for months with their their podcast. What's it called? Hard Hard Truths podcast. Great podcast to listen to. Um, so I, should, I gotta check out that report. So finally, we've got we've got about four minutes left. So that's a minute per person. Um, and Dallas uh, was asking for uh, a, 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 a message of hope for youth. We haven't really talked about youth yet in this panel. Um, but he says, you know, how can we send a message of hope to these people that are so important to our communities, our workplaces, and quite frankly, our key and essential services, including healthcare? Without hope, they may just pack up and leave. So I'll give you one minute each, and then I'm going to interrupt at the end. So uh, yeah, who wants to take it away first? Kara. Yeah, I would. I would say if the system that you're stuck in is broken, step out of it. Do something different. Look at what we can do. To, to move forward and to meet the needs of our community for us to thrive together collaboratively. And if, if the, the existing system, which we know is shattered, <laughs> um, isn't going to work to move it forward or if it's going to be a slow process, then do what you can now together as a community to change that. And for our youth, I think it's an excellent opportunity for them to, to be creative, to step up, to try new things. And when it works, share that knowledge because that's the biggest hindrance to the incredible movements that have happened in our region is the knowledge sharing. Have those conversations and get people inspired and excited about trying something different. And when something works, tell everybody who will listen. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, yeah, I have a, a 12 and a 15 year old and, uh, you know, I struggle really mightily with this issue as we, you know, think about the future and whether or not our kids will be able to live in the, the same community. But I guess uh, the hopeful part is, I think, you know, if, if people, uh, you know, work together uh, to create a system, uh, you know, where everybody does rise up with the tide, I think, you know, that's, that's the key. So we need those, uh, to me, I think we need those foundational uh, investments to, to improve um, and to um, you know, break some of the stereotypes around, uh, you know, like, you know, laziness that has been so predominant in our society that if people need, um, you know, some kind of assistance or core benefit, that somehow that's about laziness, I think we need to challenge those things and, you know, make sure that, you know, if we look at hierarchies of need, that things like housing and food and uh, core income levels are, uh, are addressed within our society. So I think, you know, I, I, hope, I hope my kids will uh, be a part of working towards that change and that generations going forward. Now that we're, you know, in this crisis that we're in, 
um, we'll work hard to, uh, you know, make this about the people rather than about uh, the financial markets. Thank you. Sylvia. Um, I think there are a few things uh, that can be done, and uh, especially up and that is part of the work that we are doing at the Coalition for Preventing uh, Youth Homelessness uh, with our partners. Um, and, um, and I think that we need to go really high up uh, that stream and uh, be able to empower those uh, young people with um, uh, what I call um, everyday, everyday life uh, skills that they require, that schools teach about, you know, many things, including budgeting, including... Uh, soft skills that are required for uh, obtaining jobs and and um, and living a, a, the life that you dream of. And I also think there is another piece uh, for those of us who are uh, inching towards the end of our career that we need to embrace uh, young people coming into our workplace and actually make a proactive effort to uh, intentionally bring them into our workplaces and mentor them and coach them so that one day they will take our jobs and that they feel inspired to continue the work that has um, begun. Because there is a lot of hope, we just have to make space for it. Thank you. I can already see the the youth coming for my job, so uh, I'm not too worried about that one. <laughs> Diana. I, I, want, I want someone to come for mine eventually, yes. <laughs> uh, Diana, you were, you're muted. Hi, um, I, I'm very hopeful and my hope stems from the most recent municipal elections. There was this sense of sort of division and toxicity and negativity in our community. But the recent election, I just saw this incredible amount of collaboration of positivity within the council candidates across all the different ridings. Um, and then a real mandate in terms of where the votes came for more density on housing, for more bike lanes, for more climate action. And it felt to me like a validation of what I feel is possible for our region and, and what and, you know, we as a community can do. So that to see positive, positive visions and positive voices and collaboration and, um, and civility win that election tells me that across the region we've got a ton of possibility for building a community where there's opportunity for everybody to live work and play in a way that gives dignified incomes and livelihoods so i'm i'm very optimistic and i feel a renewed sense of hope for our region thank you so much and thank you to all the speakers um i i have really appreciated this discussion it's been a lot of fun um and to our sponsors we have uh, Coast Capital Savings and the Victoria Foundation for sponsoring this important conversation. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And thank you to our presenting sponsor, RBC, and our Catalyst sponsor, Van City, for supporting Rising Economy 2022. Thank you all for, for attending. Uh, and keep in mind, at 1030, there is another panel, uh, or another talk is Higher Education Preparing Us for an Uncertain Future. Uh, thank you again for joining this session, part of Rising Economy 2022, and you can head back to the Whova platform to continue the conversation. Have a good morning. Thanks, everybody.